My name is Nikki Boyd. I am the curator of mammals, ambassadors, and applied behavior at the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. Hello, I'm John Rossi. I'm a touring drummer with a passion for animal conservation. When I'm on the road, I spend as much time as possible visiting zoos, aquariums, and conservation organizations. Now, I want to share those places with you. I'll be talking to keepers, vets, conservationists, anyone who can help me in my mission of connecting my people to animals through their people. Join me on my Raw Safari. Hello, 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 and welcome back to the Raw Safari Podcast. Y'all, if you know me at all, then you know that my favorite thing about zoos and aquariums, the stuff we talk about every week on this podcast, is the cool, funky conservation work that gets done at them and gets funded out in the wild by them. And just, you know, anytime I can turn one of these episodes into a conversation about conservation, uh, I do it happily. I love to do it. Well, okay, that's one of my favorite things at zoos. The other thing that is my favorite thing about zoos, because we all know I have more than one favorite always, is um, really stinking adorable animals that I love. And so when uh, a former guest and good friend of, of mine and of the pod, Nikki Boyd from the San Diego Zoo, reached out to me suggesting that we have a conversation about how you can inspire people to care about conservation at zoos and also how that can then get applied to actually helping conserving the same species in the wild. Yeah, to say that I was on board is an understatement. And, you know, the truth is, um, while I would have done this about any animal, and Nikki and I both share a passion for red pandas. So, uh, yeah, this is going to be a really cool chat with our friend Nikki Boyd from the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance that looks at how we can fill the knowledge gap of people as they come to zoos and, and teach them about how to help conserve red pandas in the wild. And we're going to hit it from a couple different perspectives. So you're going to hear about the red pandas at the San Diego Zoo. You're welcome. We're, we're going to talk about what they can do and how they serve as ambassadors and, and all the amazing stuff that just having pandas that people can see makes a difference. Then we're going to talk about how you inspire those people to care about our friends at Red Panda Network who are out in Nepal actually saving this species. And then we're going to talk about a third element of it that's actually a, a new element to this puzzle that I am really excited about. So all of this is very interesting, very fun, very nerdy in the best way. And um, I will tell you all, even as somebody who is deeply invested in red panda conservation, uh, I learned some stuff in this episode that sent me over the edge. At one point, Nikki just had to laugh because I was trying not to verbally interrupt, but I was like wiggling my hands and dancing like an idiot. So um, sorry for that, Nikki. But no, it's so cool. It's so exciting. So I am going to uh, turn this over now to my interview with Nikki Boyd of the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, Red Panda Network, and another thing we'll talk about soon. I'm based at the San Diego Zoo. We have the two parks. Um, and so that means I get to work with a little bit of everything. I uh, work with... Um, the curator of mammals is my newest role, so super excited to have uh, that opportunity to work with some of the the big species. We just got a new male elephant in, a new male giraffe, and uh, a new rhino yesterday, so Ooh. lots of fun. I know, very exciting. Um, so I work with a variety of species in all the ambassador teams. So we have four ambassador teams here at the zoo. And then, you know, the applied behavior program is the zoo-wide animal training program. So I get to, you know, help with training, whether it's birds, mammals, or reptiles, so... I always say I have the best job at the zoo. 
I I agree. That's that's just oh, that's so much good stuff. Yeah. Um, and of course, when we're talking about the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance and the zoo in particular, it is the world famous San Diego Zoo. Um, and I just I love that that y'all use that like in branding and stuff because it's so true and it's such an earned um title. Every time anyone asks me my favorite zoo that I have been to, and you know I've been to close to 180 now yeah okay. it's always it's always san diego i i get bored saying it sometimes but y'all just it is amazing um so first of all i want to say thank you for being on the podcast i uh, always Thanks appreciate our time and um you know even though we could talk about all that fun new stuff very specifically you reached out to me because you want to share about how there are all these different ways to help save red pandas whether we're talking about in the wild or in zoos and you are such a unique person to help with this because you you get to do so in three different ways. So let's start off by talking about um, the red pandas at the zoo and what you're doing there with the pandas and how that can help conservation. Well, thank you. You know, um, when I started 32 years ago, I joke, I started when I was five, but um, <laughs> I was a keeper with our red pandas and just fell in love with the species, just like you have. Yes. And um I went to a conference and I saw a guy with a giant banner outside at a booth saying, help save the red panda. And I was like, I want to do that. And uh, that was Brian Williams. And he was the founder of Red Panda Network. And as we built a relationship and he came and helped, uh, I helped him actually schmooze like donors for Red Panda Network with our red pandas here at San Diego Zoo, just educating them and making them fall in love with the species. Um, it's hard not to. Uh, he asked me to be a founding board member. And so we've been uh, Red Panda Network Incorporated for um, 17 years now. And so uh, we focus mostly, most of our work in Nepal. And my goal, you know, from the San Diego Zoo perspective, and we are a conservation partner with Red Panda Network here at San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, um, and we have been for many years, uh, thanks to me kind of championing it. But, you know, red pandas are very popular here. We have four um, individuals here at the San Diego Zoo, and we've, uh, we're have we one of the first zoos to ever have them in the United States. And so people just fall in love with them. They're the original panda. I call them the OG. I guess we should call them the OP. But um, <laughs> <laughs> discovered 50 years before giant pandas, and they live in such a critical hot spot. I think that's one of the information gaps that you know we're trying to fill is teaching people that not only protecting red pandas if you support red panda conservation but it the the himalayas impact like 500 million people so they they they're quoted as protecting one-fifth of the, the world's clean air and clean water um and so red pandas kind of become this flagship species that help uh, the world, you know, we want to sequester carbon and saving these forests for the animals and restoration work that we're doing over there really helps conserve um, red panda habitat. So most people who come, they love to see the red panda. I met a young girl today. She's like, it's my favorite animal. And the next girl next to her was like, it's mine too. And so they had their red panda shirts on and, you know, you've got like, you know, pandemonium when it comes to red pandas a lot of times. I mean, the giant pandas are pretty awesome too. I've worked with them as well. Um, but red pandas just have a really special place in my heart because I've taken care of them for so long and been able to conserve them. And so as you'll hear through this podcast, we're, I'm working in a couple different ways, but at San Diego, I think that the, the educational message and that connection people make, not everyone's going to get to see red pandas in the wild. I went to Nepal last year. I didn't even see them looking for them with guides. They're that hard to find. So getting to see one in the zoo really helps you see their personality and just fall in love with them. It really does. And, you know, since we're talking about the zoo aspect of it right now, I, I want to um, I want you to have this moment to illustrate exactly how that works by talking about the four pandas that are there, sharing a little bit about their um, personalities, their behaviors. And I, I don't care if you start with her or not, but obviously I need to know about our little baby because this is just so exciting. I guess she's not that little anymore, but, you know. Yes, little Pavitra. We call her yes. Pavi for Pavi. short. Yeah. So um we do have Pavitra, Adira, Lucas, and Cola. And um Lucas and Cola came from Cincinnati Zoo, which has an amazing breeding program for red pandas. And um 
one of the places I got to go and I think I actually met Cola before he even came in, um, nice. unknowingly that he was going to come to the zoo. And we all worked together with the species survival p- program through AZA, which is, as most people probably listening know, it's our accrediting body, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And so um, these four are very near and dear. Now that I'm curator mammals, you know, the Javi and Adira actually live in the uh, Wildlife Explorers Base Camp. So they uh, have moved over there. Um, I did not know that. Yes, because the, <laughs> the, the canyon habitat's under construction. So they're back in, you know, where I started and what's the new children's zoo. Um, and then uh, Cola do just some some construction. So they're moving out temporarily. Cole is going to move up towards animals in action and one of our open habitats up there. So that team is super excited. So I'm just spreading the love with all of my teams to be able to take care of this amazing species. (laughs) Um, And so, yeah, eventually Adira and uh, Lucas will have another breeding recommendation per SSP recommendation. Um, So maybe we'll have more babies, but yeah. Uh, Pavitra is actually a little bit bigger than her mom already, but mom's oh, still wow. the boss. So I was okay. over there today and, you know, when, um, mom wants the bamboo, you know, she, she kind of nudges Pavitra out of the way. And so it's funny them crossing over the, the branches together. Uh, it's definitely like a teenager with her mom because she's about, she's showing signs of now it's time for her to move on. And so she's, uh, probably going to get her own space as well. And the breeding recommendation for herself now that she's maturing, so Pavi's not our little baby girl anymore. She's all grown up, but she's kind of like a teenager at this point. That's awesome. I I cannot wait to eventually I need to get back out there. You know that. I say that all the time. But I um in particular because uh, you know, I know Lucas from Cincinnati and I know Adira from Toronto. I got to hang out with both of them when I did episodes there and um they're both near and dear to my heart and the fact that they had their own baby. I'm like, "Oh, that's so good. I really I mean full wait circle." To meet her. Yeah, it's yeah, just it's so cool. And I love that she's developing this little rebel personality already that's so fun because i feel like adira is very like when i knew adira now she was still very young so maybe this has changed but she was not the most confident girl and she was very shy and very quiet and it sounds like she's definitely grown into uh, a more confident adult out there yeah i mean you know motherhood will make you do that right like she was (laughs) a great mom like uh, we were you know, it was first time mom. We weren't sure. She's pretty young herself and she did everything right. She, you know, it was really interesting. She brought her out and put her in a, one of the outside dens. Um, and we were like, oh no, it's summertime. You know, is it going to be too hot? And so we te- test the temperature. We kind of got in there and just put a hand on the baby. Baby was not hot to the touch. It was a very cool cave. And um, mom would go in and take a nap. <laughs> then she'd come back out. And she would almost, as if she was looking to make sure she wasn't going to lead anyone to her baby, she came out and she scoped out the habitat and made sure nobody's looking before going straight to the baby and then go check on the baby, let the baby nurse. And so we were like, do we intervene? Do we put the baby back in the air-conditioned bedroom or just keep an eye on it? And um, sure enough, when she was ready, she moved her back in. I think she just needed a little mom break. And <laughs> but she, ha- we were watching these natural behaviors and observing like what they would probably do in the wild. So they wouldn't lead a predator straight to the den. They would scope out their habitat first before going to the den. And so it was really cool observations. And we even got on video, when the baby starts to wean, they... I will chew up some bamboo and they'll do this like uh bamboo feeding. So the baby will be like, almost looks like it's suckling off the mom's mouth. And it was recorded uh, in the Cologne zoo in the red Panda, the biology red Panda book by Angela Gladstone, who's our chair of red Panda Network. And we got it on video and my keepers were like, what is happening? And in the book, it says that they'll do this behavior of mom chews up bamboo and the baby will eat it. And it's the way to wean off of milk and start eating bamboo. And they're like, it happened for like two minutes. And in the book, it says, we saw this at the clone zoo for two minutes. And I was like, I have the answer to you. So sometimes it's good to get the old hard book, hard back book out and open it up and, and don't look on the internet for everything. But there's some great uh, information, documentation of, you know, observations that we're making in managed care that we can apply to maybe wild species or conservation work down the road. Um, but it was really cool to to watch Adira blossom as a mother. That is wonderful. I love that so much. And then tell tell everyone a little bit about Lucas because he's just such a special goober. 
<laughs> yes, he is. I think, you know, he was so cute and, you know, he came from Cincinnati and, you know, normally he would move out and they're, they're not a social species, but, you know, I think, you know, at Cincinnati, they had some together. And so it was a little bit before Adira came in. And then I joke when Adira came in and we introduced him for breeding, he was sitting on the branches like, oh, just staring at her. Like he was just like longingly like, that's my girlfriend. So, um, <laughs> you know, he was very happy to have another red panda with him again. And, you know, he's maturing now, too. He came in. He was pretty young. But um, but yeah, at first she was not impressed. And it took some wooing to get her to be impressed by Lucas. Like you said, he was a little bit of a goober. But I think he's maturing into a nice, uh, very successful male red panda now. So happy to see that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I remember one of the things that you told me when we were just discussing red pandas, because that's what we do in our friendship, um, is that it's very important to you that the red pandas at the San Diego Zoo are red pandas and that you really in the way that y- y'all work to train them and to set them up for success with the um you know with their habitats and um with how far you go with training and and human interaction with them and stuff that it's very important to you that at the end of the day they show panda behaviors yes um and it sounds to me like first of all you're knocking that out of the park especially getting that video of adira that's amazing but um why is that important to you in terms of what we're talking about here which is again sharing the conservation message of red pandas at a zoo all right we'll be back after this quick break What's all around you, almost everywhere you look, and makes your life better? Birds. Learn all about these beautiful creatures in this wonderful new podcast called Birds of a Feather Talk Together. Two experts guide two newbies on their journey to learn more. Mallard ducks, ivory-billed woodpeckers, Hawaiian honey creepers, blue jays, cardinals, sandhill cranes, and more. Each week we discuss a different bird and walk away with a better understanding of the birds all around us. Oh, and we have a ton of fun doing it. Listen now. You're going to like learning about these birds. I guarantee it. Yeah, I mean, you know, zoos, a lot of the species we have are assurance populations. Um, They live in such a harsh climate and, and terrain in the Himalayas. It's hard to know exactly how many are left. The estimates are between 2,500 and 10,000. Unfortunately, if it's closer to 2,500, that's pretty scary. That's about how many giant pandas are left. Um, And so I think that letting, even if they're in managed care, that they have uh, environmental cues and they rely on their senses of exploring their habitat, that's really important. Um, So we do a lot of what we call outcome-based husbandry so that the animals have reliable signals that normally maybe they would know in the wild. So Let's say it's raining, you know, animal knows how to find shelter. Um, Here we kind of simulate and create experiences. And so, for instance, with uh, Pavitra and Adira, a a mother would want to push her cub off at some point and be like, okay, time to go, time to move on. And so we're watching those behaviors and we're seeing them. And then we're going to take the opportunity to... Why would a panda leave its mom, obviously weaning, but also maybe resources are getting depleted? And so we need to set Pavitra up to be able to move to her own space with more resources. So sometimes we can diminish some of the resources. Obviously, we're going to feed them and make sure they're taken well care of. But for some of the species, we've like reduced some of the plants. Maybe they don't get the really the best of their favorite food items. They get their food and everything. But then when we move them to a new space... They get this lush environment with all the resources and all their favorite things. And it's like, ah, this is why I moved. And so as we move habitats, we create an experience around moving, try to simulate why they would move in the wild. And so these are just some examples of of how we manage, you know, the wildlife here. We have a lot of seasonal outcome-based husbandry things as well. Um, So it's a lot of fun to let red pandas be red pandas. And then they have a relationship with their environment. And their staff, we do training and we do a lot of outcome or um, operant condition behaviors or voluntary injections or uh, creating, getting on a scale. But then when we're not there, we want them to be searching their habitat. So we create different foraging opportunities. Um, You know, we we can have, you know, 
maybe a red panda would have, you know, a bird migration going through there. So there may be chances for us to put nests or feathers or things out in their space as if the birds were migrating through or it's springtime and birds are nesting. So we do focus a lot on environmental cues to manage our red pandas. And do you think that people, even though they don't, the average zoo guest doesn't know that they're seeing, you know, all of what you just described. Right. Do you think that it, it helps with the authenticity and it helps them connect more if they see an animal that is, I mean, obviously wildly charismatic and they're seeing the most, for lack of a better word, I guess, authentic version of it? Yeah, people love to see animals doing natural behavior. Um, and I know we're trying to flip enrichment on its head. So we're calling it an experience versus giving, you know, a panda, a ball with holes cut in it that they have to roll around to get the ball, the food to fall out. So that's kind of the traditional enrichment was to extend foraging time. But now we can be strategic and, um, you know, they eat a lot of bamboo, for instance. So they spend a lot of their time eating bamboo. So we have all these elevated platforms with, so we, we design the habitat to give them, you know, this canopy space that they love. So they hardly ever have to come down on the ground. They have this, you know, whole circuit that they can do. And then the the bamboo is up high. So people see them elevated on a branch eating bamboo and it's very naturalistic. And so uh, when I was over there today, there people were just loving watching the two. And of course, you know, they're crepuscular. So they're active in more of the dawn and dusk. So it was, it was around 10 a.m., but we had reserviced their habitat and given them all the fresh bamboo. So they're very active in eating. And it, there was just crowds of people and they're obviously a fan favorite and and just being active and moving around people just love to see that that's so cool yeah i mean i know i love to see it so <laughs> you don't have to work hard to convince me yes. on this one um very cool so it sounds like the zoo and and you and your role at the zoo is doing a lot to promote a love of red pandas and a, a compassion for red pandas um and then when it turns to the actual conservation thing um how do you turn pandas into being interested in conservation especially through something like red panda network that that you're also a part of yeah so um red panda network has really evolved since we started it a long time ago and we have, of course, <clears throat> great campaigns like International Red Panda Day. Um, we just just started uh, a campaign where we're going to do Run for Red Pandas, um, so people can do their own fundraiser, and it's a month long opportunity. And so, um, you know, we try to hit it in a variety of ways. So, if kids want to get involved, we have these fun activity packets on the website. And so, teachers or zoos or summer camps, anyone wants an activity packet, they can download it for free and get the younger kids involved. They can paint or you know cut out a red panda mask and color it. They can become a panda ranger. And we're finding kids are like donating their birthday party money to red panda conservation. And so we start like, you've know, got the, the future generations of conservationists. We start with some fun activities. Just, I mean, kids just love it after red came out and Kung Fu Panda and all the cartoons with red pandas. It's really kind of elevated them. It's probably the number one plush that we sell. I mean, who wouldn't want this, the cutest little red panda plush? I have, I'm looking up because I have them all around. Yes, thank I'm you. holding one up right now, but I have more. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, I can see two, three in my office <laughs> right now. So, um, you know, kids just love holding on to the plushes. And then, you know, as you grow older, you know, the teenagers love them. There's all this anime with around red panda. Um you know, there's, there are a little more prominent at zoos, so you can see them at your local zoos. So a lot of people go and fall in love with them at zoos. And so <clears throat> we have some really easy campaigns where if you donate a dollar, it can plant a tree. So we had a red plant a home for red panda campaign and every dollar planted a tree. Cause we just plant little saplings, of course, you know, and so um, that was very successful and people feel like they're giving back. And again, kind of explaining that, uh, you know, sequestering carbon and how trees help, you know, not just have a home for a red panda, but they can help clean the air and, and reduce the climate change effects of our deforestation efforts. And the work with Red Panda Network, you know, goes way above and beyond just planting trees. But, but to your point, to getting people involved, we, we engage them in a variety of ways. People want to help people. So sometimes we're telling them about our community-based conservation work and the teams of people in Nepal. Some people want to do an eco trip. So we have that for 
for zookeepers as well as general public. They can go to Nepal and, and go on this amazing trip. That not only kind of inspires you to see the space, you could get to plant a tree, you get to go to a tea house where the tea is grown and supports the community there. In Nepal, where 25% of the wild red panda population is, they actually, um, the the eco trips and the, the biggest, um, what is it, the domestic out product of the com- country gross is, domestic product they think yeah the gross for. Yeah, GDP, GDP is yeah. ecotourism yep. and so by having that option for the community to to make money to save the forest is a win-win so they make money and they want to preserve the forest so that people want to come see it and they learn how to to do tour guides they they get to take care of the nurseries that plant the plants there's all these different ways we engage the community they make handicrafts that we sell at Sue's. And so they're 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 proud of their natural heritage, and so they get to preserve it. And it, you know, it's it's a poorer country, so they do cut a lot of the trees down for fuel for their, you know, cooking and heating their homes. But we now that we're raising this conservation money, we see these challenges, and we can combat them with fuel efficient cook stoves. Um, you know, their their livestock can overgraze red panda habitat, so we teach them how to make corrals so they don't have to overgraze. And then when they're and spending less time out there cutting the wood, then they can actually learn how to, you know, maybe go to school or um, grow their own crops or do things that support them even more. So I remember just walking through the airport in Nepal and I had a red panda button on and someone said, oh, you're with Red Panda Network. Thank you for what you're doing for our country. And so it was really just a genuine um, good feeling to to help the community there. Um, and it's the support of all of the people who come to the zoos or, or the zoos can also support, um, red panda conservation, but it takes, you know, this global effort to save the red panda. And so that's one of the things that I'm most proud of is being a part of that process and constantly looking at the next thing. How, okay, now we've done this. How do we, how do we keep getting people engaged and wanting to do conservation? And then let's show them what, what it does. And then we have that success and we're even scaling this to other um red panda range countries like bhutan is now modeling some of their conservation work after what red panda network's doing in nepal so it's really uh gaining a lot of momentum that's awesome and i mean it rightly should it's it's a wonderful organization that um i know when i talk to a lot of conservationists uh it, it you know they lift it up as as red panda network being a model that they should follow for whatever species they're trying to save, especially with their um, community-based conservation like you were talking about. I remember when I first really got interested in Red Panda Network, it was right around the cook stove thing was happening. Mm. And I remember looking at it, and I'm not even going to lie to you. I was like, why the heck should I give money to humans having stoves. I want to give money to save red pandas. The appeal did not make a lot of sense to me back then. Now, my listeners know this, but for anybody who's listening because of you being on here, I did not come from a conservation background. I'm a musician and it made no sense to me, but I read about it and I, you know, and, and red panda network does a great job. Um, communicating what they're doing. I'm, I'm proud to be a, a writing volunteer for Red Panda Network. Um, and I was blown away by how much sense it made once I understood it and how important that was. But if you had told me, okay, John, you know, we're going to give you a bunch of money to go save Red Pandas. Cook stoves would have never crossed the top like 100 thoughts in my mind. <laughs> It's actually a, a strategy that we're using in a lot of different areas, like South America as well. And it not only helps like burn the fuel more efficiently, it, it reduces the, the smoke in the air for the women mostly that are cooking the food and it reduces the um, respiratory disease and problems that they're having. And, the, you know, just the irritation. Imagine like working around a campfire all the time. The wind blows a certain way. It's in the house usually because it's very cold up there. It might heat the house a little bit, but you're breathing in that smoke. And so it, it is definitely like also a one health approach, which is a big conservation strategy um, that has been successful. But yeah, I, I'm very proud to hear that you say people use us as a model because when I was starting, I was like, well, let's look at Cheetah Conservation Fund and let's look at Snow Leopard Trust and what are they doing? And so we've we've modeled things and looked at what other people are doing. And there is a universal strategy um, for 
conservation standards that I've been trained to go through. And you model out your results chain and, and you, you know, you have your threats and your strategies and your objectives. And it's a very thoughtful process. So it is really fun to kind of put it all together. And as I'm going through the training here at San Diego Zoo, I'm using Red Panda Network as my model and thus driving conservation funds from San Diego Zoo to Red Panda Network. And, uh, you know, the strategies that we have in our strategic plan for Red Panda Network are just, you can result them out in a chain and see what's being successful. And then if you, you know, some communities, maybe the government agencies aren't as willing to work with you as some others. And so you might hit a roadblock. And so it's like, okay, now you have to do another strategy. How will I get them on board? And, you know, education is a powerful tool, but, but it's, it's, it's a complicated yet similar process to conservation work all around the world world. That's really cool. Yeah, I, I really like that. And yeah, it is. I will tell you, it is amazing. So I do, you know, on average, four to five interviews a month for the podcast. And I always ask for a conservation organization at the end. And not all of my episodes, not even half of my episodes involve red panda keepers. But I am amazed at how much yeah. I will spend 45 minutes talking to somebody about the cheetahs and the tapers that they take care of, whatever. And then at the end, I'm like, what conservation organization do you want to give a shout out to? And they go red Panda network. And I'm like, really? That's That's amazing. It happens all the time. And I think some of them are just kissing my butt because I like red pandas. So some of them, it is your like signature animal on it is, but it is, it is, but yeah, no, that, that is, uh, that is something I think is really cool. And now, there's another thing that's going to be um, happening that that is going to help conserve uh, red pandas that you are shockingly a big part of. Um, but uh, the AZA, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, the accreditation body that you were talking about earlier, has officially launched a red panda safe program, safe meaning saving animals from extinction. And I'm so excited about this. I'm also a little surprised by it because most species have an SSP or a safe and now there's going to be a red panda SSP and a red panda safe which I think is interesting shows that they're getting all the love so can you talk about what's been going on with the safe program so far sure so I'm I'm also on the steering committee for the SSP for red pandas and I think what AZA was hoping to do is the safe program is kind of taking the responsibility of conservation and fundraising off of the SSP so the SSP can focus on population management And uh, then AZA can also use SAFE to kind of track and leverage how much zoos are supporting conservation, because we all know we're doing it, but there wasn't a really good mechanism to kind of, you know, track and, and, and kind of educate the general public of how much we're doing in conservation. And then also scale it up, like continue to drive and push harder and and do more. So Red Panda is the 41st safe program. Uh, We, we put the application in early on, but you know, there's a lot of species with like elephants and and rhino and cheetah that, um, you know, they had a lot of top tens. And then um, we finally throw our hat back in the ring. It got approved in the uh, initial top 50 is, yes, it's really good species to protect, but then nobody really championed it. And so, um, this year we reapplied. Uh, Sarah Glass, who runs the SSP, said, "Hey, would you like to be the program leader?" And I was like, "Yes." And I have a great partner, um, Shof, Dr. Shafkat Khan, who's now at the Pittsburgh Zoo, who has really he goes to Nepal and works with our red panda team. He's a restoration expert, and so he's really a big help. And he's reached out to a lot of zoos. We have about fifteen institutional partners, and so my goal is to teach zoos, how they can support red panda conservation even more. So I have luckily AZA tracked the last five years of red panda conservation. So now I have, um, uh, you know, a target to beat so that I can show how much the red panda safe program is increasing knowledge. And then we have these fun research projects too. So you've heard of like canopy, you know, bridges that go over overpasses or roads Mm -hmm. We want to model that and maybe use AZA zoos to kind of help as a research project to see if red pandas will use a canopy bridge and then use that for conservation efforts in Nepal because the anthropogenic impacts of red pandas. So roads going through, red pandas avoid roads. And so can they, you know, luckily we're not seeing a lot hit by cars, but we also, even if there's resources, my research student with the master's program, with the AIP master's program, shows that red pandas will avoid heavily, 
you know, trafficked roads. And so if we can build these canopy bridges, can we bridge the gap to increase genetic diversity, to, you know, reduce the bottlenecks of populations to create corridors? Um, Red Panda Network has already helped work with re restoration to create some corridors to help populations not be so isolated. Um, so, yeah, I, I saw you get really excited about that. Did you want to add something about that? Not just... add, but that's just so cool because I, I know, you know, like you said, Red Panda Network has done a lot to try. So habitat fragmentation is obviously a huge is issue for red pandas. Um, and it cuts down, like you said, genetic diversity and also even just opportunities to find mates because you're right. They're going to stay away from the roads. Right. And so the idea of using an overpass kind of like I've heard about wildlife overpasses, as a matter of fact. Uh, later this month, they're going to open start uh, open construction on the largest one ever in the United States uh, in L.A., yeah. um, which was inspired by that mountain lion P-22. It's amazing. But the idea of applying that to um, the, the, the various uh, fragmented habitats in Nepal is amazing to me. And I already know, I mean, I know we don't have, I, I'm not a scientist, I don't have the research, but I can tell you that at the Philadelphia Zoo, they have a big overpass between two exhibits that they open up and the pandas go through it all the time. At Greensboro Science Center, they have two of them and the pandas use them religiously. I know for a fact that in those situations, pandas are willing to do this. So when you suggested it, I'm like, yeah, you obviously need to do the research and take it further. But holy crap, what a great idea where there's already evidence that it will work. Yeah, I'm really excited to hear that. I know. I just wrote those zoos down so I can reach out to them. So nice, yeah, yeah. It, that's what, you know, Red Panda Safe, I think, can connect all of us. Um, and thank you to you, too, because, you know, you have that great connection, which is why I was so excited to do this podcast again and really help bridge that knowledge gap of what we can do and what we're planning to do and get people excited about it. So, um, you know, I encourage people to, to go visit redpandanetwork.org. And then if you're an AZA member, you know, get involved with Red Panda Safe if you can. I, I've had, you know, 15 zoos like raise their hand and say, we want to be institutional partners right off the bat. Um, I've had a handful of people say, I want to help with the steering committee, even yourself, John. So mm -hmm. I'm going to figure out a way to get you in there. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, there are people who are um, just super excited to to take it to the next level. And that's what is really exciting about Red Panda Safe is that it can really help mobilize and and make uh, zoos aware of how they can help and get their, you know, members and guests and donors to be excited about a part of it. Zoo Boise just gave us $90,000. They have, they're building a brand new red panda uh, complex. And so it was very unexpected. We didn't have to apply for a grant or work super hard for it. And, and we just were so excited because it just allows us to continue that great work and scale it to, you know, more uh, spaces of uh, red panda habitat that aren't managed more than 50 percent of red pandas are outside of managed spaces so they're they're not protected and so we we do you know anti-poaching campaigns and why a panda doesn't make a good pet and you know you don't see it a lot here in the states but there are places that do traffic wildlife for the pet trade um and so we're trying to educate people on all the reasons that you know you should protect red panda and and you know luckily um, they're really hard to get to and, you know, it's, you know, harder to go find a red panda, but unfortunately we still do get traffic pandas and, and, um, we, we get called when there's a, you know, confiscation and we try to help get them back into the wild. Um, so that's something that zoos really help with too, is husbandry care. I've helped some confiscated pandas, you know, that weren't eating really well. We have zoo vet advisors that can help with how to treat a red panda. We, um, we also have, we know what they're susceptible to. So they're very susceptible to, to canine distemper. So how they should be vaccinated, or maybe you're vaccinating the dogs in the community. We do a whole rabies vaccination campaign. So the, the, the ways to help red panda are, are I want to say endless, but they're, it's vast. And so there's something for everybody, even if it's a cook stove that you don't understand why at first. <laughs> but yeah, Red Panda Safe is going to be just another, it's going to take it to a whole nother level. So I'm super excited about it. That is really cool. And I, 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 I love that I get to have this explanation on the podcast because I'm not going to lie. I've actually had a lot of people ask me, well, 
but red pandas are still an SSP species because a lot of the smaller ones are kind of transitioning from an SSP to a safe or, or vice versa based on like population. I know there's a lot of that going on right now. Um, so it's really cool to hear what the plan is and why it makes sense to have both. And uh, I'm, yeah. I'm fully sold. Yeah, it's, it's like really, if you think of it as two different things. So mm -hmm. the SAFE program is really just, you know, the conservation arm of AZA. The SSP changeover was really to kind of manage populations that made sense and that we can really invest the population biologist time and everyone who works at a zoo is usually very busy. And so which populations make the most sense to manage as an SSP or is it a provisional? And so there's certain criteria for an SSP that has nothing to do with SAFE. But so the, think of them as a, just it's like safe as a whole nother arm. Um, and there are like cheetah has a SSP and a safe program. So, you know, African penguins have an SSP and a safe program. So there are um, multiple arms. And I think AZA recognized the fact that we could do better and make sure that we're doing more conservation work. And so they have their own goals through the SAFE program. And Dr. Jackie Ogden, who was one of my bosses here at San Diego, she was one of the propelling leaders for safe. And so I knew it was in, in great hands. And as they launched it, um, you know, they, they were trying to under get people to understand how they can do more with conservation. And then also AZ has got a little pressure, like you should be, you know, this should be a percentage of what you're doing. And so that we can share with the world, all the good work that we're doing that maybe they don't all know about. So that's another knowledge gap that I think Red Panda Safe is going to help fill. That is really cool because that is something that I am constantly talking about on this podcast. I hear about I hear about these stories that are amazing and I share them and I only hear about them because like someone from a program contacts me like almost like, you know, like they're allowed to, but it's almost like, hey, I don't know if you've heard about this and I, I never have. Or like I was at the um, the AAZV conference uh, this last year and um there was this whole thing about how a bunch of zoos had contributed populations of bongo to rewilding them. And here I am, a person who does a zoo news episode every week, who is completely invested in this world and also who has people sending me. I get at least 16 to 20 people sending me stories that they've seen each week and nobody had heard of it. And when I talked about it on the podcast, everyone was like, that's amazing. And I was like, how are all these different facilities that did this not talking about it? And so I, I think getting that spotlight on there and, and having dedicated safe programs to not just doing the work, but educating about it and sharing it and filling that knowledge gap, like you said, is a brilliant idea. Yes, for sure. Was was that the program in Kenya with the bongo? Yeah. or? Mm -hmm. I know I was actually in Kenya and they had like this big field and they, the bongo would come up sometimes for feeding. And then they were like, you know, you wouldn't even see them most of the time because they were out in the field, but that was a long time ago. So it's super cool that yeah. Zoos need to be able to tell these great stories and a lot of people love hoofstock too. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, there are some great hoofstock stories and you know, the, the world is shrinking is you know, people are expanding in the wild spaces are shrinking, I should say. And so there's not a whole lot of wild left. So we are definitely managing it. And I see a big role for zoos in the future, um, helping share the knowledge for what we learn in zoos and also those assurance populations and the husbandry. There's a huge crossover and we work with a lot of conservation partners. Um, so it's really exciting to be able to to tell the story, to to be on your podcast and to, you know, to let people understand you know, another amazing species of red panda conservation. Um, but, you know, you could put in bongo, you could put in cheetah, you could put in in what we're talking about and and that's happening at a lot of zoos. So it's just, I love shouting it from the rooftops of what good work zoos do because they're really necessary. And so thank you for sharing the word. Of course, that's what we do here. I love it. Uh, but I can't let you go yet because you still owe me. It's still Ross Safari. I don't care that you came on here to talk about red pandas and that you asked to do this. You still owe me. It's time now, don't you know? We've come to the end of the show. But there's one tale left to go. You're gonna laugh and say, oh no. It's time for the Ross Safari poop story. Okay, so funny thing happened today. <laughs> um, so we were looking at a couple of our burrowing owls and, um, I was touring around one of the new, like business best practices managers at the San Diego zoo. And there was a pile of 
I called it, I said, it looks like zebra poop in the habitat. And so the wildlife care specialist came out and said, <laughs> you know, burrowing owls, when it's breeding season, they will take dung from hoofstock and put it right outside their burrow so that the insects come and eat it. And then they don't have to go very far for food while they're worrying about their nests. And she said one time a guest came by and was like, wow, I didn't realize their poop was so big. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, you know, not every zoo guest gets, you know, understands it. But I thought that was super funny. And it was it was a great story. And I learned something new. I didn't know burrowing owls did that. And then when it dries out, they can use some of it for nesting material. And I, I said, they don't have a great sense of smell, so they don't mind. But uh, <laughs> but yes, it was it was a great story. And there's my poop story. Poop story. That's amazing. I love it so much. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for having me. Well, there you have it, folks. Nikki Boyd, San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance and uh, Red Panda Network and the Red Panda Safe Program. I was so excited to be able to talk about that and, um, you know, to, to kind of answer some of the questions that, that we've had even on the podcast brought up about, oh, wait, why do we need a safe when there's an SSB? And now we know the answer. And it's uh, it's a really good one, y'all. I'm really happy about that. So real quick, since I uh, didn't say this at the beginning of the episode, don't forget to make sure you're following along. Make sure that you um, hit subscribe so you don't miss any of these episodes. And make sure that you're following along at Ross Safari on Insta and Facebook and X and all the places. And at Ross Safari Pod on the TikTok machine. And then um, that's really all I have to say for this week, except, of course, speaking of red pandas, you know, we got to say thank you to my red panda level patrons who are our top level supporters for the podcast. And those are Dr. Laura Shank, Dr. Stephen Williamson, Barbara Bennett and Jenny Owens. And as I always like to say at the end of every podcast, don't forget, y'all. The word credits backwards is Steider. The Ross Safari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Rossi. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Ross Safari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Ross Safari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.